So you've got a bearded dragon, or 10, or 100, but with all the morphs that are coming out and the morphs that exist, it can get kind of confusing as to what makes this particular bearded dragon morph or that particular bearded dragon morph. So I'm back here in Orlando at Fairy Tale Dragons. I'm gonna meet with Heather Moy again. We are going to do a complete bearded dragon morph breakdown for you guys so that you guys better understand bearded dragon genetics, but also hopefully it'll give you guys some really good ideas for your bearded dragon breeding projects. Say that three times fast. Bearded Dragon Breeding Project. Breeding Dragon... Okay. I'm Dave Kaufman, and these are my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. All right, so as you remember from the last video we shot here, this is Heather Moy from uh, Fairy Tale Dragons. It is great to see you again. Nice to see you. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we are going to kind of break down all the bearded dragon morphs out there. And what are we going to start with? Uh, I thought we'd start with Paradox today because that's one that I get the most requests for, the most questions about. Yep. Um, there's a lot of confusion about it, so I thought I'd try to bring some clarity to that today. So this is a little guy that I produced this year and he is a hypo translucent. Okay. Now he started out um, very different and he changed rather early. So I did happen to catch this one. So right now he's a full expression. Um, there's no patching on him anywhere right now. There might be one or two scales somewhere, but right now at this time, he's for the most part, he's full expression paradox. This is his sister, same pairing. They started changing at about the same time. She started changing slightly before he did, but if you notice the expression on her isn't as isn't full. She's still high expression. Um, her head is in shed right now and her tail. Um, her legs are heading into shed, um, but she is um, a moderate expression. Okay, this one is Shadow. I produced him last year. Um, he is actually, he looks, if you notice, like his eyes are dark, very black. So he looks as if he would be a translucent, but he's not. He's actually a het. Um, his father, which I'll show you in a minute, is titanium. Um, and then his mother, and he is not het for trans or visual trans, his father. His mother was het for trans. Um, so he was considered a 50% pos het, which obviously if I bred him, um, he would go ahead and prove out for trans. So if you look at his belly, you see the patching. Um, he was initially, when he was about the age of the uh, male that I just showed you, he was solid. If you notice now, he's starting to revert back some here. His color is coming back here. The splotches here and the toes. All right, so this is Shadow's father. Mm -hmm. His name is Titanium. He is over five years old. He's about five and a half years old now. So, and he originally, he was this, he's a hypo. Um, he was pretty red. He went into shed and turned completely silver. And then right now at the age of, like I said, five, five and a half, he is reverting back. So more and more, we're seeing more of his original color. He's in shed right here and also on part of his tail, but. Yeah, I think I met this dragon last time. You and did. I just love those yeah. orange splotches on him. So, but he was uh, very high expression initially. Like I said, he was, um, completely silver. He had just a couple splotches of the orange red around his eyes and then he has reverted back somewhat over the years. In dragons it's not really paradox by true definition, it's just um, that name was attached to them early on when we really didn't have that much information. So Got it. And are they as, replicatable? They like are. They yes. are. Okay. Yes. So it when... is heritable. We just don't understand what the key is, what the magic is that allows the gene to turn on or turn off. I see. So um, they're extremely variable, so it can be incredibly confusing. It's confusing. And most of the time they don't hatch out of egg as visual paradox. It typically happens between shed three and five, although um, we do see a lot of variation of that. I've had them come out of shed one and they've changed. I've had them reach adulthood and change. So it's really kind of all over the board. And because dragons have a tendency to produce so many offspring, um, it's really difficult to have hard data and track it. With paradoxing, in like let's say ball pythons or other snakes or other lizards right. it's not genetic it's not replicatable 
Right. But it, it doesn't seem some... to work that way in Bearded Dragons. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. So initially it was thought that it wasn't replicatable. Initially it was thought that it was completely random. Initially it was thought that it that both um, trans and hypo had to be present. Um, I've proved that they do not. All right. So okay. moving on to genetic stripe. So the genetic stripe right now is the community considers it to be a dominant mutation. There's still a little bit of work to do on sure. it. Um, but that's currently one of the newer projects that many of us have been working on over the last couple years. And he's actually a dunner as well. He's so a dunner that, as Yeah, well. he okay. is also a dunner. So the stripe is, uh, you have the solid stripe down either side of the spine and oftentimes into the tail. Um, and then the dunner mutation is a scale mutation. These are two reds. These two are siblings. This one is a visual hypo. This one is het for hypo. You can tell the difference in them, um, the effect that hypo has on an animal. If this one was not hypo, the, the, uh, the two dragons would look very similar. When it comes to color, people a lot of times will name them various things, sunshine, smoochy coo, whatever. Um, and it gets really confusing for the buyer right. to really be able to determine what they have. Those of us that have been around for any number of years, really prefer this is a red, this is an orange, this is a yellow, this is a whatever, and, and the color that's present, rather than trying to assign all of these names. A breeder can get a dragon from me, a dragon from say Phantom, put them together, and they'll call it, you know, Rainbow Sherbert. And it just confuses things. Um, so it is better to just, in my opinion, um, to, to keep it simple. Uh, so that we know what a, what somebody is looking for is to just leave the fancy names out of it. I agree. So, and you know, when it comes to mutations, obviously we want to to have a name assigned to mutations, so there's a clear understanding. But when it comes to color, um, you know, it's just it just you know, you, I mean, you can have one entire clutch of reds, and they're all going to be varying degrees of red. So try to call you know, try calling those rainbow brights or, or whatever, skittles, whatnot, really confuses the issue because they're not all visually gonna be the same. All right, so moving on to the whiplets. These are two hypo whiplets. Uh, these are siblings. This one is in shed, unfortunately. This one obviously is not. Now the difference between these two, besides the shed, obviously, this one is a leatherback. So the leatherback is an incomplete dominant. When you pair two leatherbacks together, you do produce the silky as a result. Uh, there's a lot of controversy concerning uh, the silky. Some breeders like them, some don't. Uh, personally, myself, I do my absolute best at not to produce silkies. Uh, that being because most pet homes have a more difficult time caring for them. Their care requirements are a little bit more complicated uh, than the other mutations. The whiplet is a recessive mutation. So again, you're gonna need two copies in order to produce a visual whip. The whiplet is a um, lack of pattern. It strips the pattern, but not the color. It does have a tendency to reduce the color a little bit. It, um, it does have a, a little bit of a color reduction to it uh, compared to their siblings, um, but it can hold color quite well. On a whiplet, the shoulder pads on them, say for example, you have a very high white whiplet and you're trying to decide whether you actually have a whiplet or a, um, uh, a zero, for example, the whiplets do not have shoulder pads. All right, and then we'll move on to the zero. Yeah, this one's actually a hypo zero. So this one appears more white. It's more of a gray white, depending upon whether or not they are um, fired up or down, if they're cold, if they're stressed. Um, I have a lot of people that will contact me and ask me if I have a paper white dragon. Um, and this is definitely what they're referring to, which is the hypo zero, and that's gonna be the most popular of the zeros. Um, these will go ahead from, like, a, like I said, about a gray up to a high white. Um, when they are not stressed out, nice and fired up, warmed up, they'll be a high white. Uh, the zeros without the hypo gene have a tendency to be more gray. The hypo trans will be almost like a lavender in a zero, and the translucent zero will be um, a darker lavender for the most part, darker lavender gray. The zero, um, that gene strips both pattern and color. Sometimes when they're young, they still might have a little bit of the pattern showing, but it's, uh, it sheds out within a few sheds, it's gone and it vanishes. All right, so we have seen 
some really awesome morphs here and what makes those morphs and what makes those combos. What do you think the future holds for bearded dragon morphs? Right now for some of us, a lot of us are trying to back it, take it back a few steps to be honest with you. Earlier on, we had um, a lot, many breeders were trying to do as many combos as they could and we find that that's really not what's best for the animal. So at this point in time, a lot of us are kind of taking a step back. I found that I really like to have just one or two genes present rather than five. Um, it doesn't mean that a five gene combo can't be beautiful or doesn't work. It's just overall, I found that for me, I really like the animal, the overall look of the animal. It starts to get muddied out and a little confused, you know, as to what you're doing with the animal. Like a Dunner, for example, is a beautiful representation. Uh, they're absolutely gorgeous as adults, but as a translucent Dunner, it's almost lost on you. You almost can't tell. You know, in conclusion with this, it's it's all about responsible breeding at this point in time. Viticeps has been in captivity now for over four, uh, over 30 years. We are starting to see the beginning signs of inbreeding depression. So those of us, there's, there's several of us that are taking steps to try to mitigate that and try to walk that back uh, through both, uh, through several means, one of them being hybridization, uh, the other being, um, you know, kind of walking back the combos so that we're not creating five combo animals. We're just going with one or two combos. Uh, and like I said, it, you know, it's not about, it's not that the five genes can't be beautiful, but in most instances, it does end up kind of muddying the animal um, and, and may contribute to um, a, um, an increase in the uh, inbreeding depression that we're seeing. So a lot of us are just kind of walking that back. Being really selective about what you decide that you want to breed um, is a really big thing. I think um, many times new and up and coming breeders, they buy an animal, they may spend like, I, you know, I've spent a thousand dollars on an animal and it never made it into my breeding program. Just because you buy an animal doesn't mean you have to breed the animal. Sometimes they have developmental issues. Sometimes, you know, they have a severe underbite, severe overbite. Uh, they have growth development issues. So, um, you know, that's not an animal that you're gonna wanna take and breed, you know, or it may have had health problems that you were able to overcome, you know, and the animal is okay, but not something that you would wanna put into a breeding program to produce a healthy animal. So I think that's one of the most important things. Um, a lot of times when I'm selecting an animal as a future breeder, I'm selecting dragons that coming out of clutches that have, a, you know, a really good hatch rate, uh, you know, 100% hatch rate or, you know, 98% hatch rate that all the babies um, are similar in size and for the most part grow at a pretty even rate rather than, you know, high variability. Um, so there's different things that I'm looking for. I think that's something that moving forward um, that we throughout uh, the community, not just in Bearded Dragons, but throughout the community really need to um, keep that in our mind when we're selecting uh, what we want to move forward with in our breeding programs. Well guys, now you see when it comes to Bearded Dragon videos why I constantly come back to Heather Moy and Fairy Tale Dragons. She is such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to Bearded Dragons, Bearded Dragon morphs, and Bearded Dragon breeding. So Heather, thank you so much for having me over again. Real quick, I just want to thank all of my Patreon supporters. If you would like to become a Patreon supporter and get early access to videos, discounts on merch and so much more check my patreon link in the description below and guys as always thanks for watching and until the next reptile adventure love the planet feed your reptile obsession and rattle on <laughs>